we are going to go through Ruby Frankie's journals this afternoon. Basically what's happened is all the evidence in the Ruby Frankie case has been released now. We have everything. We have got all of the video footage, we've got the journals, we've got the pictures, we've got it all. The journals, however, personally, I feel like after reading these journals, she reminds me of Lori Val of Daybell. If you remember, um, I did cover that case, Lori and Chad Daybell were like doomsday cult people. They were Mormon. They thought the end of the world was coming. Um, Lori thought she talk, she could talk to God and that it was her job to recruit people. Um, she started seeing demons in, in everyone, including her own children. And she ended up killing her own children. And reading her journals, that's the road she was on. And I honestly believe, like in my heart of hearts, if her youngest son did not have the courage he did that day to run away and get help, I don't think they'd be here today. Like it literally was getting worse and worse. So as you know, um, Sherry Frankie had taken, stolen journals from her family home and Kevin lost his mind. It is not these journals. However, I wish to goodness they had those journals because now we know what kind of stuff she journals. These journals, this journal that we got was one she had with her at Jody Hildebrand's. So it was taken in the search warrant. The, they did not have a search warrant apparently for Ruby's family home, so they didn't get those journals. Those journals I think would tell a lot about what was happening before Jody Hildebrand's and possibly what, if any, um, involvement Kevin had in the whole thing. But this one is just from May 21st of 2023 until July 15th. So it, it's just like a short kind of piece of time that we've got this, these journal entries that have been released. At least that's all that they've released for us. They may have more journaling, um, but these ones, they say it all. She's, I, I'm going to say that she's lucky she didn't go to court because if all of these journals had have been brought up, like they would have thrown, a, uh, thrown away the key, I'm sure. Now, the other thing I want to point out, when their plea deal came out, um, if you followed the case and followed um, my lives, you'll know that Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand both admitted to certain things that they had done to the children. And I kept saying like, why would they admit this? So I was convinced that they had like texted each other about it or there was video recording of it or something. I just, I, I didn't understand why they would have admitted to these horrid things. Like she admitted for her youngest son, RF, she admitted to kicking him with boots on. She admitted to um, holding his head underwater. She admitted to covering his mouth and plugging his nose to restrict oxygen. Um, they, it, it, it was horrid stuff. Jody admitted to either forcing or coercing um, the youngest daughter to jump into cactuses. And you can imagine how painful that would be. And they admitted to making them run um, on um, dirt roads with no shoes on. The, 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 the stuff they admitted to I just couldn't believe they admitted to it, but now we know why, because it was in her journals. She wrote about it. So she knew it was all in here, in her own words. She couldn't deny it. So that's why it was in the plea deal. That's why she admitted it. And that's why those specific incidences were written in there. But there's more in the journals she didn't say. All right, thank you, darling. All right, guys, trigger warning. This is so disturbing what she did to her children so disturbing the way her brain worked and what she was thinking. The whole thing is just, it's messed up. So we, as I said, the date for this is May 21st until July 15th. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Stacy, for your first gift. Um, the whole timeline was done by Ruby. It's like she writes the date and then she kind of um, like shorthanded a lot of it um, and wrote, wrote out things that she did on the daily. She didn't have a date for everything. So some of them are a little bit assumed, but the majority of it, she had dates on it. So the first couple entries that she got, she talks about, I'm just going to call them R and E. So R is the youngest son and E is the youngest daughter. The reason I don't say the names guys is because they're not of age. They're not adults. They're children. Um, they didn't deserve to have any of this done to them and they don't deserve us sharing their name and information. So we just kind of refrain from using their full names. Just say R and E or RF and EF, please. Lily, thank you, darling. All right, so the first thing she talks about 
in her plea deal, they both admitted to making both children do what's called wall sits. So they have to put their back against the wall and squat and hold that position for an extended period of time. It is brutal. I've done it in CrossFit when I we used to go to the gym and do that. Um, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. They admitted to making the children do this. So on this particular day, she writes in the journal that R was refusing that day to do the wall sits and said that he's done. I was like, good for him. Like, good for him. However, she upped the game. So because he refused to do this, she made him stay outside and sleep outside until he would do them again. So he had to stay outside and sleep outside. And he was only allowed to come in to use the bathroom and to shower if need be. So this was like he was living outside like he's an animal. She um, also comments at this point. So if you remember, we had talked about the fact that um, R had run away before, but she had caught him. So it talks about that. It was during this time where he was refusing to do the wall sits and they were making them, making him live outside. He ran away at 1.15 a.m., it says, and uh, she ended up finding him at 3.14 a.m. I can't even imagine how mad she must have been in the middle of the night searching for him for two hours. It doesn't give detail where he was, um, but it was the middle of the night. So he had been outside. So she obviously noticed that he was missing at about 1.15 a.m. And she found him at 3.14 and brought him home. Um, there's a weird entry in this talking about, she says, Jody, E, and J. And J is one of the middle daughters. Um, she says that they drove to Arizona to find property. And she writes land with like exclamation points. Once we get into this, you'll understand why I find this kind of disturbing. It almost sounds like they were doomsday planning. And I feel like, they were trying to get even further away from society, like find land somewhere where they could just do what they, uh, anyway, we'll get into this. Um, on, it, as we kind of move down, the, some of the pages in the journal are redacted. That means it's completely blacked out. So whatever she wrote about, we're not allowed to see for whatever reasons. Um, so there was a couple pages, like pages um, three, four, five, six, and seven, I believe it was, um, that were all heavily redacted, that we couldn't see it. Um, then she talks about on the 10th that it's actually um, R's birthday, which this just breaks my heart, but she says in it that he doesn't even know what the month is, so he doesn't even know it's his birthday, so she's not even gonna like acknowledge it or worry about it. So his 10th birthday went by, sorry, his 12th birthday went by on the 10th, and she completely ignored it and acted like it didn't happen in her own words in her journal um she writes i never envisioned him being 12 and still pooping and peeing himself then she goes on further in it to blame it saying it's satanic choices that he's satanic the fact that she wrote that he was having accidents like that that he was pooping and peeing himself is a huge huge sign of trauma so i don't think this was just going on for those few months she was at Jody's house I think this had been going on for quite a long time for him to have reverted to not being able to use the washroom himself she said that um his the, the his kid's behavior has um basically made him not be able to, to control his own bodily functions so she completely blames him she says it's satanic and that he can't control his bladder that his behavior is doing this um she said that she told him on this day again it's his birthday he doesn't know it, but it's his birthday. Uh, that he emulates a snake. He slithers and sneaks around looking for opportunities when no one is watching. She called him a compulsive liar and said that he's got a cold, dead heart. This is things she's saying to him that she believes. Um, she says in the journal, he's always been able to get what he wants. And now that he can't, he's furious. He's furious because you're making him do wall sits and sleep outside. Like... Anyway, again, we're going through Ruby Frankie's journals, guys. So this is disturbing, just a trigger warning. Um, it's, it's awful. A couple more pages after that were redacted. So we weren't able to see what was in it. Um, and then on page 10, she starts talking about R um, and saying that he wants to find God and that he needs to fast. So to not eat and pray. Um, and that he's in and out of possession, she talks a lot about. Guys, thank you so much for the popcorn. She goes on to say that he's possessed, that he's satanic, that he has Satan in him, 
um, and that he needs to find God in the way to do that, according to her, um, is to find God by fasting. So this is when she started allegedly the starving of them, not feeding them. She says that the only thing consistent about him is his lying. She says nothing else is consistent. Uh, and she says that E, so the youngest daughter, that she's better behaved for Jody than she is for Ruby. So she acknowledges that her behavior is better. Then she goes on. So if you remember in the videos that I've posted of the police officers finding the youngest daughter, they actually thought she was a boy because she had a buzz cut. So Ruby talks about this a number of times. She shaves or she cuts her hair and then shaves her head a few times as punishment in these journals. So this is what she says. Um, she says, I gave E a pixie haircut. All her long hair is gone. No more distractions with hair. God, it, this is horrendous, you guys. These journals are disgusting. Um, then she goes on to say that the youngest son, R, told her he would rather have a glass of water than her as his mother. I gotta say, this little boy just... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get upset here. I love that he had the courage to run away, but reading this journal and hearing that he actually talked back to her or was trying to fight, like God love him. Like God love that little guy. Sorry. I'm going to be emotional throughout this. I'm just warning everybody because as I was reading through these the first time I was bawling. So just a heads up, I'm going to try, but it's a lot. Okay. Um, she says that um, E, so the youngest daughter, manipulates her. So, she, oh, sorry. This was when Ruby says that E manipulates her. So she was saying that um, the youngest daughter is better for Jody and that she thinks she can manipulate Ruby and she's better at it with Ruby. And says that um, she won't scream when Jody's around, but with Ruby, she wails and cries and hits her head on the tile floor. Sorry, that got me again. So even E is trying to fight this. Like she's, she's balking this. She's having a fit. R was told to stand in the sun with his sun hat. He's defiant and says no. I tell him a couple more times. Or should I say his demon tells me no. And I push R into the sun as punishment. R comes back. I come back with a cactus poker. When I poke his back to get him in the sun, R doesn't even flinch. I poke him on the neck. He's in a trance and doesn't appear to feel anything. So she, sorry, oh my God. I've already read these and cried. I didn't think I'd have a hard time. She basically goes on to say in this journal that she believes he's possessed and that it's this demon when really he's trying to protect himself and fight back. So he wants to be in the shade and she's telling him to get in the sun. So she's like poking him with this, whatever this cactus poker is in the back. And he doesn't appear to feel anything, she says, because it's the demon. Like he's trying to look tough. He's mad at you. It continues on the next page. Ruby says to him, do you know that I love you? These are her quotes. Do you know that I love you? Do you know that Jody loves you? Do you know the Savior loves you? He replies to these questions with, yes, ma'am. She says that she takes her old mop water and she goes to him and she shows him the water and then she pours the water on him and it's hot outside and, he says, and she says to him, it feels good, doesn't it? And he says, yes. I told you guys, this is awful. No wonder they took a plea deal and didn't go to trial. Can you imagine a jury hearing this stuff? Like she'd get 30 years for a joke. I hope, I hope every year they have to read these journals to the, the parole board before they, they can speak. I hope, uh, anyway. Okay, sorry, I'm squirreling here. Ruby then says to R, do you know that I love you? Do you know, oh, sorry, I just read that part. Um, Jody later pushes R into the pool and then pulls him out after a bit. Later, they asked if he wanted to be pushed in the pool again, and he agreed. So I guess he was actually liking being pushed in the pool, even though they were acting like it was a punishment because it was so hot. And again, he was being forced to live outside at this point. 
Ruby tries to make some sort of metaphor at this point, and she's talking about underwater and how R can hear her under there or something. It, it was weird. I, I don't know. It was like gibberish. Um, it said they write down that he starts crying after Ruby talks to him about being underwater. And she covers his nose and mouth with her hand and talks about being underwater, like holding when they were holding him underwater. So she she covers his nose and mouth at this point and actually records it in the book that she did this. He voiced um, that he wanted to beat her up in the, the, that morning. Um, and then he was intrigued and interested um, apparently the handwriting was a bit weird at this point, but it looked like that's what it was saying. And he basically said that he wanted to beat her up. Um, she said that two hours later, he drinks water from the hose and that he stole the water, that he wasn't allowed to have water. And he went to the hose and, and basically took it. So she writes that he's compulsive and he feels no remorse and that he wants to go to jail and he wants to worship the dev devil and has no interest in changing his ways. She says in quotes, he doesn't actually know what jail means. He has no comprehension what throwing your life away even means. He just wants the immediate gratification of sitting in an air-conditioned car to ride to juvie. He wants stimulus, she calls it. Because he wants to get out of the sun and he'd even go to jail to do that, she claims it's stimulus. Uh, page 13 in the journal we're on right now, guys. She says again that that he stole water. So the youngest son, she's saying that he stole water. He was angry and looked like he wanted his fists up. So this whole time he's showing his rage towards her. He's showing his anger and she, it's like, she's laughing at him and just blaming this demon or devil. Ruby says, um, in this, th on this page that he has no idea what he's doing, but she, um, says that she does and that she can help him. She's, she's trying to convince him like, you know, you're uneducated. You don't know what's happening, but I do. I'm going to help you. Uh, she wants him to tell his demon friends that she's not going to stop and she's going to win. And then she has that, uh, the power of God and that he's got to obey her. Um, and R says, he's gone. He left. Like he's trying to tell his mom that the demon's not there anymore. <sighs> Ruby takes E and R later on, um, according to this journal entry, on a car drive to the gas station and she tells E that she's never going home again. This is all that, that they wanted um, is to go home. They didn't want to be Jody Hildebrands. They just wanted to go home. And if you recall, when Ruby first um, was going to Jody Hildebrand, she wasn't taking E and R with her. She was leaving them at home. So they got to stay with their middle sisters and not deal with this woman. But then there were so many calls from the police and so many calls from Child Protective Services that she ended up moving the two youngest to Jody Hildebrand's with her. And that's when this junk started. So she says that um, she's never going to go home. She shows E old pictures of her on a swing, like just torturing her, saying, here's, here's the fun you had at your old home. You're never going to see this again. Um, they stopped to watch the sunset, apparently. Um, and Ruby says that um, she can become innocent through repentance. So if he repents, so she basically says that um, she can have salvation if she is repent, if she repents, like Eve, he would even know what that means. Um, she says, R and E have been counting the days. R did know that yesterday was his birthday after all. So if you remember the page before, she says he doesn't even know what the month is. Today's his birthday. He has no idea. So she didn't do anything or acknowledge his birthday, as you can imagine. And then the next day she's like, oh, I guess they've been counting days. So he did know it was his birthday. It's like when you're in prison and you scratch out the days on the wall. It's like they were doing that, like counting the days they were there. Um, on the next page, she says that um, E tells her. Uh, that she figures they've been there around eight weeks. So they've been counting that many days. And Ruby asks if she, if she thinks that she's made any progress. And the little one says, yes, that she has. So Ruby tells her she's delusional and that she continues to lie and manipulate and she hasn't made any changes. Just shoots her right down after this eight weeks of therapy she's supposedly getting. Um, ugh. 
Ruby then apparently takes the kids on a four hour car ride and just makes another pointless like analogy in there about a cow, something about a cow. I don't even know running across the road or something. It was weird. She gets weird in a bit of this stuff, um, but talks about how she just wants to keep her kids safe. And that's why she's doing all this. She buys a pie and she tells the kids that this pie is for Jody as a thank you for everything Jody's doing for their family. Um, she says, she writes in there too, that R seemed engaged in this and E was being manipulative. Um, she says that this is the day that E was anticipating uh, breaking her two day fast. So she wasn't feeding E for the last two days because she was trying to get her to repent. Um, and by doing that, you have to not eat. So E was hoping she was going to get to eat that day. Yeah, she doesn't. The next page, Ruby tells um, the two kids um, that it has hardened her heart and she will do one more, that it's hardened E's heart, and she's gonna do one more day of fasting to invite her to be humble. If you recall, she uses humble a lot. When she took Christmas from those the two youngest children, like a few years back, she was saying they weren't humble and they needed to be. So this is why she took Christmas from them. Well, apparently she's now withholding food again. Guys, thank you for tapping the screen. You've gotten us almost at 200,000 likes. So this is all taking place, like I said, in the journals. This is between May and July. We're in July right now. She kind of like skipped a few, obviously, days. She kind of jumps um, throughout here. But we're on page 15 right now talking about this. Um, she says that when she tells E that she's going to have to fast for the, another day, she flips out and she begins ranting. She said she refuses to get up, lies on the floor all day, speaking dishonest chants is what her terminology was. Um, she says because Jody's on the phone with clients, so she doesn't want to go in there and match her level of aggression is what she says. So she says all day, E's making up rhymes. Listen to what she says, guys. This is so telling. These are the rhymes that she says E made up. My mom starves me and calls it fasting. My mom won't lift two fingers and bring me food because all she does is lie in the bed and eat brownies. My mom says she's the most loving mom in the world, blah, blah, blah. If I can't ever go home, then what's the point in being obedient? I'm going to run away. These are all things that Ruby wrote down that allegedly her daughter was saying. Her daughter was nine, like two weeks or a week before her 10th birthday when she was rescued. So she was a nine-year-old little girl and all this was happening to her and this is what she was chanting or, or singing to her mother. Jody, um, the, she then says that Jody helped her intervene after the, the, she was done working on the phone. Helped her intervene, yeah. Um, and explains that the longer the lies are allowed to be spewed, the larger the intervention is, that is needed. And she mention, mentions now physical intervention might be needed. So she's basically saying they have to break the kids and all the kids are doing is getting more and more mad. So they're dealing with this even worse and worse, which is cause it's just this cycle, this circle of horrible abuse. Like I honestly do not think that these two children would have been with us much longer if he hadn't escaped from Jody Hildebrand's home. Okay, let's keep going. Um, then she talks again about cutting E's hair. So a couple journal entries before, she said she cut all her long hair off um, and gave her a pixie cut so that there wouldn't be any distractions with hair because E apparently liked her hair. So she says, I cut more off of E's head. We doused her with water in the dog wash. E said she wanted to run away and Jody told E she has no idea what is waiting for her out there. Another page was completely redacted, so we don't know what that said. The next entry was talking about Ruby visiting um, or revisit something that R had told her a few days before, um, that he's been workable ever since he released the demon. Because remember, he was telling her like, oh, he's gone, he's gone, like saying the demon was gone. Now she's saying she believes it or something briefly. Um, she said on the morning of the 13th, she said, R and E broke their fast with different food. Ruby makes another ridiculous, um, comment in here about hornets and Satan and food or something like that. And then says something strange saying, R is full of piss and vinegar. She's mad as a hornet. She doesn't call the shots. And I'm assuming that she was talking about E for that second part saying she, um, that she's mad as, as, 
or yeah, mad as a hornet and she doesn't call the shots. Ash, thank you, darling. Um, anyway, she says it's been uh, about 90 minutes since our eight and says that he's now defiant again and that he defecated on himself. So I don't know at this point, sorry, I'm getting upset again. I don't know if at this point, if he is going to the washroom, like pooping himself because of her, like to be like, screw you, or if he's like, if it's the trauma, but it could be both. But basically he ate and then 90 minutes later, he pooped himself. But what would happen if you haven't eaten any food in two days and then, and hardly eaten anything and then you eat some, anyway. Um, Ruby says that it was too watery for him to be fasting. And then he admits that he was stealing water three times the previous day. So, sorry, <laughs> I'm having a tough time here, guys. She says that he lies and feels no remorse and that he is cheating as well. So she checks his poop and sees that it's runny. So she knows that he cheated and stole water and then he admits to it that he, he stole water three times. So this fasting that she was doing, it was including water. Like she wasn't letting them have anything. Soria, thank you, babe. Um, the next page, it, look, it seemed to continue. And it said that um, she starts in this part, she's calling the kids selfish, saying that they desire to lie and attack and have zero understanding of God's love for them. She goes on about this. Um, she explains that Jody is apparently selling her property so that she can purchase land where the kids can work. So remember earlier it talked about going to Arizona with the middle daughter and um, the youngest son and Jody and that they found land in Arizona. So now she says what it is. So she wants the kids to like work the land as punishment or something in, at this land. So she says she's looking for property. And I don't know what this is. It said Soros Cactus. Um and feeling um, more and more the need to get the kids into open land. She then in quotes says, this is a spiritual matter. I can't in good faith leave you with these two gremlins. I won't do that. These are God's children. Soros don't matter when the souls are on the line. And, and apparently this is maybe said by Jody. I, I don't even know. Um, but basically, Jody's saying she's not going to leave Ruby to deal with these kids, and she calls them gremlins. Um, Jody and one of the middle daughters, I believe, are going on a road trip to look at the property again in Arizona. Um, and then Ruby says that we decided the escalation of the kids is not manageable here. So they're not able to deal with these behaviors because there's neighbors and their kids are screaming and freaking out. Um, and now R is sitting angry and defiant. E's lying on the floor. We're going to bring them in. So remember how I said they were making them stay outside for like days and nights at a time. Now they're becoming defiant. R had even tried to run away. So now they're deciding they can't let them outside anymore like that. <clears throat> I will clean up out in the desert. And oh, sorry. It says, um, I, would clean, I will clean up out in the desert as he has pooped himself again. He will then stand and sit on the patio shaded. Now I'll see him from the kitchen. So she's going to be able to watch him is what she's thinking. I will bring into the cool house, E is what she's saying. And she can sit in the pantry. They will think they won and they will think they got what they wanted. They will relax and then pop. And she's got a whole bunch of exclamation points there. We will drop them like hot potatoes out in the desert, their new home. You're going to get exactly what you asked for, kids. Like, this is nuts. I hate that they gave her the plea deal now after reading this. And I hope to goodness that they have to read this journal every single time they go up for parole. Like, this is disgusting. We're not even halfway through this, guys. Like, this is disgusting. If you're just joining, guys, this is Ruby Frankie's journal entries that were just released. This is the journal entries that the police confiscated from Jody Hildebrand's home. All of this is the reason why these horrible women admitted to certain things in their plea deal. It's because she wrote about it all in her journal. She had it all documented. All documented, guys. Anyway, make sure you hit follow. I'm going to be summing all this up um, on my page as well. 
All right. Uh, the next page, it continues on. And she said, um, there's only one sentence on this page that's continued. And it said, oppositional force is required for growth, development, maturity. E and R have never experienced oppositional force. They are very weak minded. Oh, um, there was no date on this one. Uh, but Ruby starts talking about the wicked spirits of her children um, and saying that basically it's been a long time before this life. Like it's, it's, it gets into like crazy stuff here. She says how E and R got to come and get a body can only be explained in me advocating to be their mother. So she's like, these demons came here and got a body through me because I wanted to be this great mother. God knew I would take my responsibility to mother them seriously. Jody volunteered to help. These two souls are very weak of mind. They are fools. Um, at this point, she writes down that E said that she, could, she would choose the devil over God. And Ruby says that the disdain and hatred that they have for God is beyond her ability to even describe. So they're just rebelling. Her kids are, are rebelling finally. And they're like, screw you. Ruby spends the rest of this page writing about like boundaries and making the evil go away and truth and light and principle and all this stuff, um, doubling down on the fact that they're possessed. So if you're just joining, basically what these journals say is that she thinks her kids were possessed um, and the way she's treating them, you guys, is disgusting. Like she acts like they're not even her kids. Like it's disgusting. Um, the next page, Ruby talks more about scriptures and describing physical activities and things like that. She says, if you engage a weak minded soul in a physical activity of obedience, you can begin to break the bonds Satan made with the weak. Physically stop the acting out behaviors and begin physically doing good. Farm work, lifting boxes. If you remember, that's one of the things they admitted to was making the kids carry heavy boxes of books up and down stairs repeatedly. Um, exerting energy, exercises, the wall sits, jump rope, milking cows, weeding a garden, digging trenches. Satan cannot be where there is good. Begin doing sweating for good and heavy physical intensity capture your attention. Um, she says the hard labor doesn't work for E and R and that it's got no meaning to them, yet she just went on about how this is how you get Satan out. Um, she says that they need property. Thank you, Cece. Where a ranch can be built so that the neighbors can't hear anything and that these kids can do all of these punishments and labor work. Um, that they need a good kick from a horse and a cactus to run into. So if you remember, that's one of the comments that Jody Hildebrand had in her plea deal was that she either coerced or forced um, the youngest daughter to jump into cactuses. Um, and it says they need natural outcomes. Later, she asks um, if our, what, uh, what he's thinking about, and he answers, I'm thinking about what I want. So he like talks back to her again. Oh, Jess, thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, you got us to 400,000 taps. Thank you so much, team. Um, if you're just joining, like I said, we're just reading all of the journals of Ruby Frankie that were just released and trigger warning, guys, because it's it's disturbing. Uh, the next page. So it continued on from the page before. Jess, thank you. I love that guy. Um, Ruby asks what R wants. He says more different foods and a soft bed. So in the journal and um, in the plea deal and things, we learned that the kids were sleeping on the floor. So he says he wants a soft bed and different foods. So the other thing they admitted to was feeding them minimal food. Um, and when they did get fed, it was like the blandest food you can imagine, like, you know, plain rice and a piece of, of chicken breast. Like it was, they, they would eat normal meals in front of them. As you heard e, uh, e earlier on say, all her mom does is she's lazy, won't bring them food, and she just sits on the bed and eats brownies. It's awful. Um, Ruby then asks him, why doesn't he ask Satan? And she says, why would you serve a God who has no power to give you your desires? That's dumb. And R goes silent, apparently, after she says this. Uh, then she says, E had another episode with demons. 
She gives herself to them. She agreed to stop being deceptive with her facial expressions and crying and whining. Whining is the devil's voice. Whining is always a demon. So she completely believes that her kids are possessed um, by demons and Satan and that she has to break them of this. Thank you so much for the roses, you guys. Um, after E did the stairs, so walking the stairs again with the heavy books and the boxes, she sat on a park bench looking at the mountains and she was told to sit and be still and then eat her dinner, apparently, whatever the dinner was. Um, so this next page says, this is quotes from, from Ruby as well. Thank you so much, you guys. E woke up. I reminded her that if she whined, cried, or squinted her eyes at me or sour her face, I would be buzzing her hair off. If she's going to act sick, sick, she can look sick. She agreed with a smile. I told her because she didn't listen the night before, she would do two sets of boxes and stairs. So that's carrying the books up the stairs with a five minute break. She did the first set easily and agreeably, and after five minutes of rest, she began whimpering when she got to the bottom stair. She slipped and dropped the box. Kyler, thank you. I put her in the dog wash and... Sorry, just a sec. I put her in the dog wash and shaved her head, then went back to the boxes. Um, then something's whited out here, and E says, yes, ma'am, with tears. And Ruby says, it's heavier than the boxes, right? And she says, yes, ma'am. And then she says, I can help you find relief. You've told so many lies about me that you refuse to be obedient. Why do you keep being buddies with Satan? And then E says, I don't want to work. And she says, don't you see it's because you follow Satan that you keep doing the boxes? If you were humble, you'd be inside making pancakes with Jay and me. Sorry. <laughs> So Jay is the other sister, not Jody. She calls Jody like G-I-J or something in this, but she's referring to the middle, one of the middle daughters when she says Jay usually. Ruby then makes um, E sit on a park bench and think about her choices at the end of this chapter. Like, I, guys, I can't believe that she did this to her child, let alone write this down. Like, ah. Oh. Um, I know who Jay is, guys. I'm just not saying her name out of respect because she's a minor. So we don't use, or I don't use or say the kids' names um, for the minors. That's why I just say their first initial, um, just out of respect for the poor kids. Um, the next page. Ruby goes on to say that if E moves or gets up or does anything, talks, fidgets, you name it, um, or takes off her hat that she's got on as well, that she's going to go back and have to work. So E promises to be obedient. After like an hour of sitting on the bench, she starts fidgeting, as you can imagine. Um, and Ruby pulls her back into the house and gives her more boxes and makes her do it again. Uh, there's another interaction here between R and Ruby. And I'm just, it's just quoted here. Um, Ruby says, you like sleeping on the hard ground? I slept in a soft bed last night. Luna, thank you. And R says, I slept really well. And then she says, you're mean. Do you enjoy being mean? And he says, yes, ma'am. And she says, do you expect me to feed you? And he says, yes, ma'am. I love that he's talking back to her, but it's not going to get him any, anywhere good. We know that. And then she says, oh, sorry. Thank you, babe. And then she says that she got big over him, like hovered over him. And she said, I will feed our, I will not feed a demon. So she's telling him, I'll feed you the kid, but not the demon. So I'll check on you in a bit. And if you want food, then be prepared to tell the truth about your behaviors. Tell the truth of who I am. And she goes back an hour later. So he hasn't eaten because he's the demon. And she says, are you ready? And he says, no, ma'am. I love him, you guys. And she says, so would you rather have no food and worship the devil? And he says, yes, ma'am. I think this is getting me worse than the other stuff. Just a sec. Give me a second. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Like I went read over this like three times when I had to copy it. So I've cried enough. I didn't think I'd get upset on this, but some of it gets you. 
Okay, next page. Ah, oh, thank you, guys. The next page. Ruby goes on to say that her youngest daughter um, does her first set of books decently and gets a 10-minute break. Then she gets upset. She doesn't want to do the boxes, but she gets them done, and then she sits on whatever this park bench is that Ruby keeps referring to. Uh, she picks a flower off of Jody's plant, and Ruby says that that's being defiant. There's more boxes, but E refuses and goes to sleep on the basement floor. Ruby then tells um, her youngest son, R, to stand up and stop picking his nose, apparently. She says that both of the kids are doing this until they bleed and that it's just a distraction and they won't stop for her. Um, she talks about um, R and says about Satan again. Similar to the other conversation, he, she's talking to him saying like, you know, are you the, de the de devil? And he's like, yes. And, you know, anyway, um, she says that she wanted to give him dinner and it was chicken again, of course. Uh, but she, he needs to acknowledge that his behaviors are bad. And she tells him that he's treating her and Jody the way that he believes he really deserves to be treated, apparently. So she brings him dinner of brown rice, beans, lentils and water. So that's what he was allowed to eat, not the chicken. Um, then he, she says, what, you're, you're not going to thank me? Are you going to acknowledge the woman you've been abusing just brought you dinner? And he absolutely roasts her at this point. And he says, well, I would say thank you, but I wouldn't really mean it. Like this sweet kid. I love that he's standing up to her. So then she takes the dinner away and he tries to give like some sort of explanation to get the food back. Um, and she says that she's not going to talk to the demon and that his soul is damned and she walks away. Uh, at this point, E has started doing the stairs again without a box. Um, and she's now slipping and falling on purpose, according to Ruby. When E was outside today, it was hot. She acted like she was dying. So pitiful. This is her words. I told her, E, the heat is hell. The heat in hell is much hotter and God is going to burn the wicked. So either get used to it or start changing. And she says that Jody and Jay, so Jody and her middle daughter, um, are looking at RV trailers apparently, possibly to put on this land they're getting. And Ruby says, those kids have no idea the sacrifice is being made for them or Jesus's sacrifice is already made. Uh. Um, oh. So this is, um, I believe we've gotten up to when... Um, the youngest son tried to run away for the first time in this page 27 here. So uh, Ruby said that last night, God gave her a miracle that she'll never forget. So she says she goes to bed and that E was on the floor next to her bed. Um, and she says that she's shaking just while writing this allegedly. She talks about Pam Bodger in this, um, taking A, so the other daughter to American Fork, um, to take her, her act, her ACT. So like the two middle girls are being treated normally, fed normally. They're not being punished. Like it's just the younger two children in all of this guys. Um, if you're just joining, we're going through Ruby Frank Frankie's journals that were just released two days ago. It's extremely disturbing guys. She detailed everything she did to the kids and it's awful. Um, if you're interested, make sure you hit follow because I'm going to be posting all the rest soon as well. Um, she goes on to say that at 2.45, she sat straight up in bed from whatever this miracle God gave her was um, and saw that R was gone. Um, that he left some rocks in a message, apparently. So she runs to Jody's room, wakes her up. R's message in Pebbles says, uh, jail, I will call when I get there. Like, God love him. If you remember a few posts back, he said to her, I'd rather be in jail than here. And she was saying something about he just wants the air-conditioned drive to jail. Like, he just wanted out of there. He wanted to go to jail. Like, uh, anyway, so he wrote a note and said, I'll call you when I get there. And he just started off. Uh, they get in the car and she says that she pled to God at this point. Oh, Father, we need a miracle. We need your help now to find um, her son. She continues praying in here saying, protect me, protect Jody, protect us, yada, yada. She finds him and she's shocked. He's shocked to see her and he gets in the car. Um, she says, the devil wants, oh wait, sorry. Um, the devil wants me in prison, she says, my children dead. So this is what she writes in here after this. 
Um, the other kids go to bed. Ours put in the garage, apparently. Now, allegedly people were thinking that the kids were in the safe at Jody Hildebrand's house. The safe is not mentioned in this. Like they have not been sleeping in that. They're on the floor and then the garage. Um, he's got zero remorse, she says, zero fear, zero expression. He's cold, callous, and hard, angry. He isn't calling the shots. Um, of course he has uh, no remorse or fear. Look at how she's treating him. What could be worse, right? He's got nothing to fear now. Uh, she says that she needs this land. They have to get this intervention going. The kids have to live on this land. Um, don't let those kids' choices ruin your life, she says, to whatever the spirit told her. Um, I tied a rope to my feet and to him. So in the um, plea deal, she talks about how at first, after he ran away, she tied a rope to her and him so that he couldn't get away from her. And then she allegedly got tired of that. And that's when she started hog tying him on the floor. So this is the first day or the first time, the 15th of July, after he ran away, um, that she started tying him to her. Um, so she says, I tied a rope to my feet and him to my waist. Ash, thank you. And thank you for tapping the screen, you guys. You almost have us to a million taps. Um, she says that she tied uh, to my waist and his, and now our will now sleep in a soft bed with me. So now he's allowed in the bed because he's tied to her, allegedly. At 7 a.m., she says that um, R slept. The devil got a bed that night, which she doesn't like. At 8 a.m., they leave um, so that someone can apparently look at Jody's house. Um, they must have already had it listed. They must have been selling it. As you recall, when Jody was in prison, thank you, Jenna. Hi, girl. Um, when Jody was in prison, she was stopped from the sale of her home. It got listed. We got to see all the inside pictures of the house, but the judge stopped it because of retribu retribution pay that she's going to have to pay for what she did to these kids. Um, the next entry, page 29, she says that E, the youngest daughter and one of the middle daughters, J, um, and Jody go to Tucson and that ours home with Jody or sorry, with Ruby, excuse me, uh, tied up, presumably. Um, she gives him chicken again. He gets chicken that night, rice, lentils, beans, and milk. Um, she says that he sits at the counter, um, and where am I here? Uh, Ruby describes ours being studious and sitting there with her, uh, but she's not relieved and says it's odd in the next sentence. This is what she says. I now know that in order to keep my son, I will need to put him back under sedation. I unhooked him from all the bells and whistles and asked him to breathe and thrive on his own. And he went into arrest, a stress. I'm not sure what that means. Back to sedation we go. The demon is still here and I purposely put our back into a slumber, hibernate. Like that is terrifying, terrifying. Then she compares the demon to a cancer. Graham, thank you for resubscribing. Make sure you get my um, Discord channel so you can come and chat with us. And I always say when I'm coming live on there. Um, she says uh, at this point, she refers to the demon as a cancer patient and that r &E, they they don't want to repent. And she says that it's like an infection and now they're sick. So again, she's with this possessed thing. It sounds just like Lori Vallow, what she said when she did this to her children. She killed her children because of this. Uh, the next page um, at 8.18 p.m., Jody apparently texts Ruby saying that she found the land. And Ruby writes um, this. The devil does not want us to take R and E out of society. He did want Jody finding this property. He wanted Jody and I down at the police station, not discovering a place to bring intervention to his entanglement of my children. So he's trying to say that the devil wants her in prison. I wonder why she thinks that. Um, and that they're trying to get this land to go hide the kids out on and make them do all these horrible things. Um, and that the devil's trying to stop them. Um, she says that R only thinks that he likes the taste of milk um, and goes on about that for a bit. We're on July 16th now, the day after he had tried to run away. She says that last night she tied herself again to him and got a full night's sleep because she was tied to him in bed. She says, R showers while I watch. I shower while R is in the closet. I can see the closet door as I shower. So she locks him in the closet while she showers. 
Um, she gives him some more chicken, rice, beans, and lentils and a tortilla, allegedly. She has him do three sets of 10 push-ups and reads um, like a thesaurus thing. I don't even, th theft, I can't even say the word, um, but she's making him read this horrible book. Jody's on her way back now. And um, she says that apparently her youngest daughter, E, spent the whole way back lying down um, and didn't even know that they went to Tucson. So they made her lie in the back seat. Um, on page 31, uh, she goes into, um, debating if they had breaks and if they should, she should let the children read. Uh, it's, it's kind of weird in this whole part. She says that she wants them to have discomfort. Some of this page is blacked out in here. It's redacted at parts as well. And this part, she is a quote from her. We needed to wake the child up to the state of reality. Show them where they really are, the pit of hell. This hope was that they would choose to go to God for forgiveness, to admit their awful state. Instead, they hid. They wanted to lie to themselves uh, that what they did wasn't that bad, that they were the victims, that me and Jody are the persecutors, that burning in hell isn't real, that God is that, that God is that mad and that God doesn't even exist. They deny the power of God. So she just goes on and on basically saying that they're demons and they don't believe in God and they're not repenting. Thank you so much for the taps, guys. You just got us to a million taps. Thank you so very much, team. Thank you, thank you. This is nuts, guys. Make sure you hit follow. I'm gonna be posting the rest after. Um, the next page. Uh, she talks about Ruby and R and that they had this conversation. She tells R... Um, huh. that sedation, um, is that basically she says she sedated him, this hibernation thing that she had talked about earlier, um, that she's sedating his choices wickedly, um, says that he doesn't want, want it anymore. Or he says that he doesn't want it anymore. And he says, um, he does this by his choice. So she says to him, if you really didn't want evil anymore, you would say to me, mom, thanks for the book but I want to do boxes today, or I want to stand with my choices. You won't do that, will you? And he says again, no, ma'am. So she calls him weak-minded and an undisciplined brat. Abby, thank you so much for your first gift, babes. Thank you. Ruby writes a note to herself in here saying that she never clearly saw the devil or wickedness until recently in her own children. Uh, the next page, July 19th completely redacted out. So whatever she wrote about in there, we're not allowed to know for whatever reason. Um, then she starts off the next part by saying, to begin a separation from evil towards God, all the darkness needs to be exposed to light and that they have to engage in good work again. She talks a lot about this good work to get rid of the devil, but the kids won't do it apparently. She says, a day of fasting and prayer is needed. My children have been spawns of Satan. So again, she's, she's, calling her kids horrible names. Now she's saying that they're the spawns of Satan. Like pretty close, right? They're your spawns. Like they're sweet little kids that you had, you horrible woman. Sorry, off topic, guys. She says that the kids have been out of control, that he, that her son has been defecating on himself again. So she's written this numerous times that he poops and pees his pants. I personally think some of it is rebelling, but I'm sure a lot of it is trauma as well. She says that he's lying and stealing and running away again and that he's crying and wailing. She says that wailing is a sign of this demon, this devil that's possessed them. Um, they took E out to the desert and she refused to stay quiet and kept screaming. If you recall, one of the things in the plea deal was talking about the fact that they took them out to dirt roads and made them run, especially the young daughter um, with her bare feet on the dirt road. So this is the desert they're taking them out to. She says, she went out in the heat barefoot. E still tried to run. She screamed for another family member. She screamed for water, food, care, and love. Oh, E, such a manipulative ploy. Sorry. You are loved. And then the rest was redacted. Ugh. After some hours of her screaming and speaking nonsense, she says that she laid down and was quiet on the side of the road, so they took her home. The next day, they take both kids outside barefoot to increase the discomfort, so she wouldn't let them wear anything on their feet. Grim, thank you, darling. They were assigned to weed a cemetery at this point, and there's actually, <clears throat> excuse me, footage 
of Eve, the daughter, having to walk through and weed this cemetery in her bare feet. And it was like rough, like dirt, um, not nice grass, like in her bare feet. Um, so I did see footage of that. I'll see if I can find it and post that as well, guys, if you want. Ruby says the kids began to mellow out a bit after this, um, that R was looking for shade and cheating because he's not allowed to do that. Um, they went out the next day um, and spent five hours pulling weeds in the sun. If you recall, both kids when they were found had severe um, sunburns and blisters and some of their skin was literally peeling off because of this. Um, so this is all from weeding in the cemetery. They did five hours of pulling weeds. Um, apparently her son started getting the hang of it, she claims, and saying things like, I want to pull the weed out of my heart. What am I doing with my life? And he said, I don't want to live like this anymore. Ruby says that the kids need to work and sweat in the sun and do acts of service. And this is what's helping them get rid of this demon, apparently. Um, she says, yesterday, Ara was devious and put his head in the toilet. Hmm. He said he was hot and wanted to cool off. So Jody and I reflected how disgusting and deviant that is. It's a problem that R has no problem being gross. Um, they talk about the cemetery again here. Um, and it looks like, I don't know, that Ruby, Ruby's maybe referring to herself in third person here or something, or someone else has written this. And this, I don't know. But anyway, it says Ruby takes um, the two youngest and one of the middle girls to the same cemetery to pick up glass or weeds and a truck pulls up and that there's a woman watching them and taking pictures and video at this point, she claims. She tells the kids to stay um, by her and she keeps their faces from being pictured. I don't, I don't know quite what that is, but the woman gets out and explains that they're trespassing and then argues, I guess, um, about what they're doing. And the woman says that they have to leave and get their bags out of there. So they get kicked off the cemetery. Um... The woman starts to tell them off. Ruby gets the kids. The woman's yelling at them, saying um, they'll grow up just to be like their mother, white and full of privilege, white and full of privilege. Um, I guess from the argument, whatever Ruby had been saying to this poor woman. Um, she, the woman wants to get a police report or something, wants to get a photo of the license and Ruby drives off. Later, uh, Ruby says something about the woman was projecting her anger and aggression onto her. And she says that she talked to E&R about how the woman was attacking them because of their distortion and blaming them. Uh, Ruby says later on that she met a different woman who thanked them for cleaning the cemetery. I find that hard to believe. But anyway, she compares the kids to them and how she's helping them, even though they're rejecting the help. Um, let's see. They, she goes on in this part to say that the kids seem a little bit more affected right now, that um, they, they're so numb and she doesn't know how long it's going to hold. And she says that because E created this, she can destroy it and send them away. Uh, we're on August 1st now. This is the day before the arrest, guys, for the journals. Like, this is just, there's so much, you guys. Okay. Let's get into this. So this is the day before. So Jody goes to Tucson again, looks at whatever this property is. At one point, they say it's like 500 acres or something like that. Um, this is a quote from it, again, from Ruby. E and R are both defiant and unwilling to soften. E this week perpetually screamed outside. Jody and I accommodated her and took her to Hell Hole Road. Yes, there's such a road on your way to Las Vegas. She was to run on this dirt road. She ran for a bit and then started manipulating. I told her to run up an incline on a hillside, touch a tree and return 100 yards max. She threw herself into a tree. Oh, here's the continuing here. Jody pulled her out, breaking her flip-flops. After an hour of E jumping in this bush, we get in the truck to find a cactus. E walked right up to the cactus and threw herself in the middle of it. It was unhuman. Sorry. She acted like it didn't hurt at all. She cuddled right in. She probably enjoyed feeling something. Like, God. I watched her press her foot up against a cactus ear or something like that. I, I don't quite know what that is on the cactus. I watched with my mouth open. She was so numb. After being cozy with this cactus, she just got up and spoke with Jody for about 10 minutes. 
E walked to the truck and I rolled down the window. E said, may I have permission to speak? So I said, yes. And she said, can I have another chance at running the hill? So I said, yes. We get in the truck and drive to the hill and E gets out and comes to my window. Mother, what would you like me to do? She asks. I instructed her to run to the dead tree and then come back. So E replied, I would rather jump into a cactus. Then Ruby says, what evil, what deception. This girl would choose to be shot and die than to humble herself and do what she's told. There's no pain point where she will turn. <laughs> you guys, I just can't even understand this. This is sick. Rudy then refers to July 30th, um, the incident, I guess, that was on that day. Um, and she says that they had put E in the closet and contemplated what to do with her because she was screaming all day. If she screams, she doesn't get water and she refuses to eat, I guess, on this day as well. If you recall, when they raided the home, that's when they found E in this closet. Um, she was given pizza and it took her quite some time to be coaxed into eating it. Um, but she she wouldn't talk. The only thing she said at one point was that she was nervous. Oh. Um, she said... Oh, she talked about Jody having a dream at this point. Just more God stuff at that point. Um, and if you recall as well from the video footage, if you've seen it, of Eve leaving the, sorry, E leaving the closet, she's having a hard time walking and she's barefoot. It's from this running on the road. They said her feet were in horrible shape. Um, this allegedly is from the Lord. Uh, don't continue these physical interventions. They will only bring resentment. E is angry about her feet. Dress her wounds and leave her to me. Oh, thank you, weird. Thank you for the hat. That was cute. Um, so this is apparently the Lord telling her that they should stop these physical things and that she needs to fix Eve's, E's feet. Um, so I guess Jody cleans the feet with hydrogen peroxide, which I guess doesn't sting or else E's numb to it at this point. She says, I witnessed Jody cleaning what didn't deserve to be clean. Sorry, the dream from the Lord was what Jody was saying, not Ruby. So Ruby's like, she doesn't deserve this. Uh, then Jody carries her back to the closet at this point. He's screaming and sulking um, and apparently was given lunch at this point. Ruby says that she gave her water and scriptures at this point. Kira, thank you so much uh, for your first gift. Thank you, darling. Um, it's her first opportunity to have reading materials, apparently, since she went to Jody's. They were not allowed to have books, no form of entertainment at all. Um, and this is the first time she's been allowed to read. Jenna, thank you. Ruby says to Eve at this point, uh, when you see God, he will judge you out of these books. Did you honor your mother? No. Did you keep his commandments? No. Did you repent? No. You're in big trouble. You better get really familiar with what's in there. Um, then she says, our feet are swollen from standing so long. He's angry. Nobody cares. I told him he's, oh, sorry. Our's feet. I don't know if I just said E. Our's feet are swollen because he was standing for so long. He's angry. Nobody cares. I told him he's acting like a man having a heart attack and gets his feelings hurt because nobody cares about the sliver in his finger. When your soul is dying, nobody cares about your feet is what a response to him was. Um, at this point, jo Jody's still away, it seems. Um, and she says that he's being distracted um, by being in the house and getting socks and being held and things like this and carried out of the elements. She's reading her Bible. She's getting beans, rice, and chicken and says that she's quiet at this point. Ruby asks R at this point um, why he didn't manipulate anyone yesterday and he said he wanted to change. And she says, no, it's because you weren't uncomfortable. You weren't hot. So she's saying because she wasn't torturing him, that's why he wasn't being manipulative. Um, one of the kids is standing outside watching the rain and Ruby makes another analogy about, about rain cleansing them at this point. Um, we go back in time now. So it was the day before the arrest and now we go back and it's August 6th at this point. So it, it kind of jumps around a bit. Um, ours rage comes out as he can't have what he wants, which is to serve the devil otherwise known as having no responsibility and have me mom dote on him, coddle him. He wants both feed me, hug me, be tender to me, shower me in praise and affection. Let me lie to you, abuse you today. He rages for hours. F you. He said at least 50 times. I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm never going to change. Take me to jail where I belong. He begs. 
Oh. Um, Jody at this point is having someone come and fix the basement so that they can sell the house. Um, Ruby thinks this is a great idea. Great news, I guess. Um, R is yelling obscenities now and Jody asks him, R, what are you going to say when you see God? F you? And he answers, sure. And like, it's the word F-U-C-K in here that, that he's saying. Um, says that at the end of the day, he was docile and uh, compliant, I guess. I guess. E was crying that day as well. Um, the date goes, like I said, to the 8th of August. She says, R is very defiant. I found his fingers... I found his fingers poopy. He keeps pooping and peeing his pants. Within five minutes of him going to the bathroom. This is a sin, you guys. Um, hold on. Oh, within five minutes of going to the bathroom, um, he went in his pants. And again, I, I think part of this is him trying to be defiant and stand up for her. Like it's stand up to her. Page 42 guys says, um, this is, this is now August 9th. Ruby talks to R in here about the devil again and how he does what the devil wants him to. And he's refusing to be obedient. Um, she asks him, when did you sell your soul to the devil? And he says, when I was two or three. And she says, did he come to you or you to him? And he says, he came to me. She says, and what is he giving you in exchange for your soul? Money, fame, strength, a person? And our response, nothing. Ruby tells him that he can keep his soul, that he can still keep his soul. Um, okay, we're gonna quote, I'm gonna quote this one. R becomes aggressive and destructive. He started banging and hitting doors. I went in and kicked him. Knock this off, I said. R continues to be destructive and violent. I put on a pair of boots. I went in and kicked him again. Just a sec. You want me to stop? What are you getting from Satan when he tells you to kick the door, huh? Nothing but more pain. You want me to help you? Yes? No? And then Ruby says, do you want me to feed you? And he yells, yes. And Ruby says, no. You want me to shower and provide for you? And he yells, yes. And she says, no. You want to serve the devil and fight me and destroy all that I provide and then expect me to give to you? Go ask the devil to help you. Go ask the devil to feed you. Ruby then leaves him in the closet and says, I get that you're rageful. I got that you're angry. You should be. But you've got to aim that anger in the correct direction. You keep aiming it at me. I'm trying to help you get your life back. Get angry and denounce Satan. And he starts calling Satan a lying piece of baloney or something like that, she says. It just continues on page 44, guys. He continued raging and yelling and crying. I believed you and what do you give me? Nothing but pain. You lie. And I believed you. I'll admit it. I've been a fool to follow you, but no more. It's too late. I can turn my life around. Get lost. Get lost. I can get my life back through obedience. So this is what he's yelling to the devil at this point, apparently. Ruby asks him at this point if, he, if he's sincere and says, Ara's manipulating his hand. He wet his pants. Ruby lectures, um, goes on about the only way out of pain is to humble yourself. Um, show God how you have desecrated your precious body, how you misuse your body. Beg him to help you. And then our praise and says he wants to repent and says that he knows that he's been a fool and things like this. Um, then it goes on the next day saying that Jody and one of the middle girls again, Jay, are back in Arizona again. They keep traveling there, there to this land that Jody wanted to buy. Um, Ruby is watching are in the closet at this point. He's on the back patio. She says that it's warm and raining out. She tells R that the rain is cleaning the rocks from the dirt and R's urine. Um, tells E that the rain's going to cleanse her as well. Um, she asks um, R at this point what he's thinking. And he says, how my choices have led me here. And she says, did you know you were in a dark pit of despair? And she explains what that is, but it's redacted. Um, she says, when a human isn't humble, you have to get to a breaking point of confessing. So she says, R um, never would have disclosed his sins had he not had a hope that confessing 
if he had not had a hope that confessing with will bring a sense of relief. Um, the world we live in today does not support children being uncomfortable. They, the adults, are uncomfortable with children being uncomfortable. We've heard Ruby say this before. She was on the Connections um, podcast saying this, how parents are the ones uncomfortable. Even when E forgot her lunch that day at school, she talks about how the teachers are just uncomfortable and that E needed to be punished and not have a lunch or not be fed. Um, and so children are comforted, entertained, and distracted from the need to confess and change. Stripping down a child's world to be the basics of beans and rice and hard work would be considered abuse. You're right, it is. And it's not. It's necessary for the prideful child. I'm going to pause just for a second. The journal's here and add this part. In one of the phone calls that Jody makes to someone, she talks about this, saying that, um, you can't even raise kids um, the way you need to anymore. Like she justifies all this. She thinks this is raising kids, like all this hard work she's making them do and this like not giving them food and things. Elle, thank you so much for your first gift, babe. Thank you. Um, now that R has his behaviors out, all of them, he feels like a failure, a monster, useless, worthless. The relief he felt in confession was short-lived and now there's no shame. Maybe another word, um, can't tell it, uh, no shame to hide. So he becomes overly aggressive, destructive, and combative. Foul language I've never heard is now pouring out of his mouth. It's his only distraction. Poop, pee, damage, that's all he does. The despair comes in. He's weak, infectious, hopeless, and never felt worse. A setup from the devil, now is the work. Like This is just, oh, you guys. Um, and then it goes to August 15th and 16th. It has been three months of consistent boundaries and putting up with his terrorizing to get his confessions out. Who would do this in the real world? I don't know of anyone who would feed their kid in America beans, lentils, rice, and chicken for three straight months and refuse all distractions. And this is why Americans are so full of sin and are ready for destruction. They won't repent. So she just admitted that this is what she's been feeding her poor kids for three months and doing to her poor kids for the last three months. And as you can see from reading these journals for the last, however long we've been on here, it slowly just gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, just one sec, guys. I will be back in two seconds. I just have to take this. It slowly just gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, just one sec, guys. I will be back in two seconds. I just have to take this. So she said, again, it's been three months of all of this. It's now August 18th, two weeks before the arrest happens. Um, now the mini trampoline comes into play here. A couple people were posting, asking why there's so many pictures of this mini trampoline in the evidence. This is why. Um, it says here, this is now the second day of our jumping on a mini trampoline. He struggles with balance and coordination. Ruby's asked him to take off one sock while trying to balance on the opposite foot. So she's making him do these like activities, uh, apparently on this mini trampoline. Uh, he falls on his face. His nose starts bleeding. Ruby gets him a wet rag and toilet paper and he blows his nose so hard that new blood comes, apparently. She says that this is the easiest exercise ever, but he's refusing to do it. Um... The decrepit stature you would expect of a 90-year-old. He plays completely helpless, it says. Um, his body is full of evil, puffy infection, and he won't participate in the responsibility of flushing it out. Ours life meaning and purpose has been don't get caught. And now that he's caught, he wants to be done with life. He feels he has no meaning. Because you've beat it out of him, woman. Um, then there's some more that's redacted. And then August 21st, August 21st entry, she says, poking is a strategy technique that R seems to respond to. This is crazy. Um, hold on, guys. I got to see where I was here. Um, he responds to poking, pouring cold water on him and towel whipping him. August 22nd, she says, is the first day that R was soaked and jumped as told. He did wet his pants twice while doing this. Um, she explains how the hail 
in St. George is a mystery and that it's a heavily validation of intervention and what she's doing is right. Um, three days before the arrest, it says um, that one of the middle daughters, A, visited for the week uh, and Ruby took her back to Springfield, Springville on the Friday. We all wondered if the girls were there at the house when this all happened. So now we know they weren't. Um, so she took them back on the front, took a back on the Friday. Um, it says J a and member Pam Bodger. So Pam Bodger's in here. So J a, the two middle girls, Pam Bodger and Ruby packed 20 boxes and took to, them to some, some storage shed in Springville. Um, and uh, gives her two weeks notice at, the, at her job. Uh, and then it says, I spent the 22nd to the 25th peeing and pooping. He's out of control. He's defiant, abusive, and mean. He refuses to do what is asked. Just when I think we found a technique that will work, R digs in and fights harder. Willing to try anything that would grab his attention. I whipped him with a belt yesterday. E2. She peed all over Jody's garage floor screamed at her and lied to her. She's out of control as well. E seemed to give me her attention after the whipping. She sweeped the garage with some muscle or something like that and mopped it up. She did a good job. R increased his defiance. And that's the end. What I just read you is the journal entries of Ruby Frankie. And I honestly am sick that they were able to do a plea deal and those journal entries were not read. I'm I'm so glad they're out now and everyone can see what was in her mind. She was going down the exact same road as Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell when they unalived their two children. That's exactly the road she was going down. Those kids were not gonna make it if he did not escape and go to his neighbor's house. And God love him for doing that, you guys.